The Bible Treasury, New Series. N7. A monthly magazine of papers on scriptural subjects. Volume 27, Article 40, 1908 and 1909. Part 7 of 9. Practical Remarks on Prayer. 7. Promises to Prayer. The promises to prayer, of which the following are some of the more prominent, are, in general, dependent on specified conditions. 1. All things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive, Matthew 21 verse 22. 2. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you, John 15 verse 7. 3. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments, and do those things that are pleasing in his sight, 1 John 3 verses 21 and 22. 4. If we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us, and if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him, 1 John 5 verses 14 and 15. 5. If two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them, Matthew 18 verses 19 and 20. 6. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him, James 5 verses 14 and 15. 7. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you, John 14 verses 13 and 14, John 15 verse 16, John 16 verse 23. 1. The condition attached to the first of the foregoing is believing. It will be said that believing, or faith, is necessary to all prayer. Though this is true, Scripture recognizes specific faith about a specific thing. Thus one of the subjects of the miracles had faith to be healed, see note, Acts 14 verse 9, and it is expressly taught in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 9 that there is a distinct spiritual gift of faith which some have, and some have not a gift alluded to in chapter 13 where Paul corrects the tendency to glory in gifts. Though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, and have not love, I am nothing, 1 Corinthians 13 verse 2. It is perhaps to this special character of faith that the Lord refers when he says, What things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them, Mark 11 verse 24. Genuine, divinely given faith not mystical or fancied faith, is what is here meant. Probably many have experimented upon this promise, only to be disappointed. Muhammad, it is said, audaciously commanded a mountain to come to him, and when his folly was manifest to all, tried to evade humiliation by saying, if the mountain will not come to Muhammad, Muhammad will go to the mountain. But the promises of God, and the power of his spirit, are not bestowed to be the subject of curious experiment or the means of subserving private ends. Note. Not that faith was always required in the subject of a miracle, far from it. End of note. Further, the application of some of the promises in the Gospels was primarily to the Apostles, however much the principle of them may extend to the humblest disciple. Take, for example, the promise we are considering. This as well as the parallel passage in Mark 11, stands in relation to the incident of the barren fig tree. The fig tree was a type of Israel, to whom the Lord had come seeking fruit but finding none. He pronounced it fruitless forever. That is a picture of Israel after the flesh, producing only the leaves of profession. Any fruit bearing must be from the living one, from me is thy fruit found. In connection with this, the Lord says, Verily I say unto you, if ye have faith, and doubt not, ye shall not only do this to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things, 
whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive, Matthew 21 verses 21 and 22. Now as the fig tree symbolized Israel in the character of fruit bearer, so mountain here represents Israel as a political system, and accordingly as an answer to the faith of the apostles, Israel has been cast into the sea of the nations, and politically lost. Still, the promise in all its fullness is there, for faith to act upon. It is a large one, and its only limit is the reality of the faith which employs it. If God give faith he will as certainly give that to which the faith extends. To the next promise, John 15 verse 7, is equally large, and probably also meant for the apostles primarily, though the general principle may be applicable to all. But the limitation is a moral one. Even apostles, to whom the mighty work of inaugurating Christianity was entrusted, could not exercise their great powers as mere power, that is, apart from moral principle and purpose. Paul, for example, with all his mighty powers of healing, says, Trophimus have I left at Miltum sick, 2 Timothy 4 verse 20. God had his own purpose in Trophimus' affliction, a purpose which might have been marred by the uncalled for interposition of a miracle. And on Paul's part, his powers of miracles were not given him to be used at random, or at his own will, but in the service of his master. So also with the church at Corinth. They came behind in no gift, they had miracles and gifts of healing, yet under God's chastening hand, not to be interfered with a many were sick and many died, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 7, 1 Corinthians 11 verses 30 to 32, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 28. It is indeed the same principle as that which, already mentioned under the head of hindrances to prayer, may in some cases, restrain prayer for the recovery of the sick. An unspiritual person influenced by blind sympathy might pray for his raising up, while one more in the secret of communion with God, would discern that such a request was not the mind of the Spirit. So also, the large power of prayer in our text, Ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you, is guarded by the moral conditions, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, conditions which involve not only godliness but spirituality. If the words of Christ abide in one, they form the heart and mind. They suggest the motives, govern the conscience, and in this happy condition of the soul, its requests naturally flow in the line of his revealed mind. Its instincts are correct, its desires according to his will, according to his words. 3. If our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart, and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments, and do those things that are pleasing in his sight, 1 John 3 verses 20-22. Here there are conditions of great importance, a practical conduct pleasing to God, and an uncondemning heart, a good conscience. These are imperative for intercourse with a holy God. False, imaginary deities may accept a compromise, such as penance or gifts. God must have the judgment of evil, in all those who draw near to him. It is the same with prayer as with worship, there can be neither where there is defilement. Holiness becometh thine house, O Lord, forever, is an abiding principle, Psalm 93 verse 5. And again, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear, Psalm 66 verse 18. But how blessed that God has provided for all the exigencies of his people in a defiling scene, and hence it is ordained that, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When there is so simple a way of discharge, why should any walk with a burdened conscience? An upright and honest confession and we are not only forgiven but cleansed. As Elihu says of the soul that has been brought to the moral judgment of itself, he shall pray unto God, and he will be favorable unto him, and he shall see his face with joy. His flesh shall be fresher than a child, and he shall return to the days of his youth, Job 33 verses 25 and 26. The importance of this good conscience in connection with prayer is shown by the fact that scripture links it even with asking the prayers of others, pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience, 
in all things willing to live honestly, Hebrews 13 verse 18. The prayer of the upright is indeed the Lord's delight, Proverbs 15 verse 8, and it is the prayer of the righteous, in James 5 verse 16, that is said to have much power. Our text, however, though equivalent to a promise, is not exactly so in form. It is rather a positive statement that, given certain conditions, we do receive whatsoever we ask, and the conditions show very plainly that success in prayer depends upon a godly life, an uncondemning heart as an inward state, and obedience, keep his commandments, as an outward manifestation and test of the state. But in the verses which precede, there are some interesting points to notice, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth, and shall assure our hearts before him, verses 18 and 19. First, knowing that we are of the truth, in verse 19, does not mean knowing that we are Christians, which has been taken to be the sense, for the persons addressed were written to because they were Christians, because they knew the Father, because their sins were forgiven them for his name's sake, 1 John 2 verses 12 and 13. But, being exhorted to love not in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth, the Apostle adds, hereby we know that we are of the truth. That is, that we are actually walking in the truth, that we are possessed by, we are of the truth. Love in deed and love in truth gives us this consciousness and assurance of heart before God. We cannot enjoy it otherwise. If there are matters between us and God, it is useless to ignore them. God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. But if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God, and receive whatsoever things we ask, because we keep His commandments, and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. It is not a question of being, or not being, children of God, it is a question of the children being on terms of happy confidence with their father. If I owe a man a debt which I ought to have paid, there must be constraint on meeting him, but if there is nothing between us, and I believe in his generosity, I can confidently go to him with a request. Beautiful, happy condition for the soul to be in with God. This passage is a weighty one for the conscience of the believer, but its practical use has been the much lost sight of through the misapplication just mentioned. The test is not as to whether we be children of God. It is one for saints to apply to their actual condition of soul. Are we thus before our God, that with an uncondemning heart, we are in communion with Him, and, as a fact, habitually receiving His answers to our prayers? Secondly, the Apostle says, Let us love not in word, neither in tongue. This looks like tautology but is not so. The term logos, here translated word, is of much wider signification than our word. In English not in word, neither in tongue, certainly is repetition. But this word logos means, in Greek, not merely the word by which thought is expressed, but the thought itself. So that the force of what the Apostle says is, that we are not to love in theory, or thought, neither in mere language, in tongue, but in deed and in truth. For there is a pietistic state, by no means rare, in which emotions and thoughts are enjoyed, the truth intellectually delighted in, but without fruition. Love as a theory is held to be very beautiful, but is not practiced. The heart deceives itself. This is loving in thought merely. The text in question is the converse of 1 Corinthians 13. There Paul treats of works without love, here it is, as it were, love without works, that is, mere sentimentality. But our passage crushes both of these errors, not only condemns love without deeds but also deeds without love. It requires deeds, but the deeds must be from love, that is, not in theory, nor in talk, but in acts and in truth. Our God is love, and that alone will satisfy him in his children, love in deed and in truth. How penetrating is the word of God, exposing every mode in which the heart would either deceive itself or deceive others. It is sharper than a two-edged sword, laying bare the thoughts and intents of the heart. Many, in reading these verses, have supposed that the language was mere repetition, 
that it is not so only shows the wisdom which underlies every word of inspiration. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us, and if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him, 1 John 5 verses 14 and 15. We have already seen that the formative power in the heart, of the words of Christ dwelling there, and an upright uncondemning heart with confidence in God, are the conditions of successful prayer. In the present verses, all that is assumed. It is supposed that we are asking according to his will, and what we have here is that, so asking, God always hears us. He is not like man, often occupied so that he cannot listen, or careless so that he will not. See note. It is a precious and wonderful thing for the creature, man, notwithstanding the fall, to be so restored to moral harmony with God as to be able, under the guidance of the Spirit, to ask according to his omniscient will. We do not read that angels have this privilege, they indeed do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word, Psalm 103 verse 20, but the intimacy with God which prayer affords is, apparently, conferred upon man only. Surely this bestowment is a proof of God's desire that man should enjoy communion with himself. Do we prize this privilege as we should? Note. JND Synopsis, Volume 5. On 1 John 5. End of note. But our spirits are not always up to this level, and we have already seen that Romans 8 verses 26 to 28 recognizes this case. We know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit helpeth our infirmities. And he who searches our hearts knows how to take up all that is of his own spirit in those hearts. As to the result, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. And this gives peace, whether our requests are granted or not. So we are not to restrain prayer because we are not on the highest plane of communion. On the contrary, it is our privilege, in everything, to let our requests be made known unto God, Philippians 4 verse 6. An instructive example of this is Paul's prayer about the thorn in the flesh, 2 Corinthians 12 verses 8 and 9. For this thing, he besought the Lord that it might depart from him. But his prayer was not in the intelligence of God's mind, who had a better thing in store for Paul, which Paul would have lost had his request been granted. The believer may indeed, as a chastisement, receive that which in unbrokenness he clamors for, but the result will not be happiness, as we read, he gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul, Psalm 106 verse 15. To present our requests, with submission, is, however, always our privilege. The example of Paul shows this. He besought the Lord for his desire not once only, but thrice. In result, such submission was wrought in his soul that ultimately he took pleasure in the very infirmities of which he had implored the removal. A discontented and unsubject heart may reproach God with not answering its prayers, but in the retrospect of eternity, how much cause for praise may be discovered in the requests which our gracious God now refuses to grant. So far from restraining prayer, we really need more frankness with God. Scripture amply warrants this, and it is illustrated by the case of good Ananias, Acts 9 verses 10 to 17. The Lord sends him to Saul of Tarsus to receive him after his conversion. But Ananias has a difficulty in his mind, and with beautiful simplicity and reverence, he lays it before the Lord. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man, how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem, and here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And Ananias went his way. The Lord, it will be observed, does not in the least reprove Ananias, and the incident left on record thus surely gives encouragement to us to tell the Lord with reverential intimacy about all our difficulties. Indeed this episode, and that of Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, previously referred to, are strikingly similar as precedents for freeness, yet reverence, of communion, and withal of perfect submission. The two instances are remarkably alike in tone and spirit. 
in Philippians, we are authorized to bring all our requests to God. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, Philippians 4 verses 6 and 7. But here it is noticeable that the promise is not, as in 1 John 3 22, that we receive whatsoever we ask. But, having laid our requests with submission before him, his peacekeeping our hearts and minds, is the present effect. As to the requests, if he do not grant them, it is because he has for us something better. His child should not wish what is contrary to his will. But there is a higher example than Paul, even Jesus in Gethsemane. Not indeed, as so often in our own case, a prayer below the highest level, for even in that dark hour his communion was perfect, but here, as man, he lays the incomparable exercises of his heart before God, mentioning something which he would desire if only compatible with the divine will. Spreading out the agony of his soul in prayer, he exclaims, O oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt, Matthew 26 verse 39. Here is perfection a alike in his communion as a man with the Father about the appalling prospect before him, and also, notwithstanding the prospect, in the absolute surrender of himself to the Father's will, the Father's purpose. Yeah, we need more frankness and confidence in our communion with God. Yeah people, pour out your heart before him, God is a refuge for us, Psalm 62 verse 8. 5 The promise in Matthew 18 verse 19 is peculiar, it is to united prayer. The essence of this promise lies in the assured presence of the Lord himself with only two gathered in his name. The agreement in prayer of such a gathering is promised to be acceded to by the Father. But we have already looked at this in previous pages. The promises in John 14, 16 are to prayers in Christ's name and may be realized by the individual in his closet. The promise here, however, is to the concurrence in prayer of even only two gathered together in his name. 6 Prayer in James presents the most interesting features. First, there is the encouragement to prayer which the Holy Spirit addresses to our hearts by reminding us that Elias who wrought so wondrously was a man of like passions to ourselves, as if to say, there is an example for you, see what is open to you. Secondly, James, by the Holy Spirit, makes a positive revelation of facts in Elijah's history, which otherwise we should not have known. The historical books give us the outward acts of Elijah, James reveals the process which brought them about. Elijah's first introduction to us is in 1 Kings 17 verse 1, where the great drama of his exploits is opened with the simple statement that he said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. This is the first mention of Elijah. Nothing is said of him but that he was a Tishbite of Gilead. Who he was, how it happened that this person with no official authority, no locust stand should thrust himself into the presence of the king, and make such a dread announcement, the history does not say. But there is a great underlying principle. It is that when the official representation of God is false, God's Spirit will raise up a witness from outside. It is ever so. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him, Isaiah 59 verse 19. And there is nothing in which God's sovereignty is more displayed than in the instruments he chooses. When the civil rule is apostate, and 800 false prophets are allowed in the land, he will act by whom he will. Now James reveals the secret of Elijah's surprising action. That secret was communion with God. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit, James 5 verses 17 and 18. Thus the Old Testament gives us the magnificent public action, James, the prayer on which it was based. This secret dealing of God with his servants is his constant way. David slays the lion and the bear, 
making experience of the power of God where no one sees him, ere he wields the weapon of faith before the armies of Israel. Moses, a learned man, has with all that weight of learning, to pass forty years keeping a flock in the desert before he is used to face Pharaoh and deliver Israel. And Elijah's proceedings, which read like the intrepid actings of a hero, are shown to be the product of prayer, and when afterwards his communion falls in its level, he is discovered as a man of like passions with ourselves, for the prophet who could boldly confront the majesty of the king flees for his life at the threat of the king's wife. This shows that it is only as sustained by God that we can act for him. Without me, ye can do nothing. Thirdly, the example of Elijah is given by James as both illustration and proof of a general principle, namely, that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, James 5 verse 16. But this translation is admitted to be unsatisfactory. That a prayer which is effectual avails much is a truism. If it is effectual it avails completely, and it is anticlimax to say that it avails much when it is already admitted to avail perfectly. Mr. Darby's translation gives, the fervent, or, operative, supplication of a righteous man has much power, which is closer to the original than either the authorized or the revised version. Probably the essential points of the scripture are, a, that the supplicant is a righteous man, b, that his prayer is energetic, not a listless, apathetic, indolent performance, but the prayer of one who means it, as Paul on one occasion speaks of himself as night and day, praying exceedingly, etc., 1 Thessalonians 3 verse 10, or, as Jacob on another occasion, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. See, that prayer of this character has indeed much power. This is the moral which the Apostle James enforces. Fourthly, prayer in connection with sickness. As system has arisen and been much noised about, which takes the name of faith healing. This, while ostensibly based upon James 5, is little short of a pretense to miraculous powers. The published writings on the subject include gross false doctrine, which will not here be examined. But a brief indication of the real bearings of the scripture in question may perhaps be profitable. The passage is as follows, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, verses 14 to 16. Now in these verses, we have at the outset a defining note which restrains the application of the passage beyond a certain limit, the application is expressly to the sick among you, that is, the assembly of God's people. This scripture, therefore, affords no warrant for a popular system of semi-miraculous cures administered to all and sundry. Sickness amongst God's people stands on special ground. It is sometimes on account of sin, as we have seen, and this passage in James recognizes that the sickness about which the elders were sent for might be such, for it says, if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Not that this would be always so, but if so, his sins should be forgiven him. Again, so far from a public proclaimed system of healing, this was essentially private. The sick one was to send for the elders of the church, and they were to pray over him. Further, it might, or might not be that the patient would himself have faith to be healed. The faith healers imperatively require such faith, scripture does not. The prayer spoken of in James is the prayer of the elders, and in reference to this it is said, the prayer of faith shall save the sick. It may be easily supposed that the sick one would himself join in the prayer, and that, with more or less assurance of faith but it was the prayer of faith that carried efficacy. Finally, nothing could be more outside the scope of the passage in James than the popular notion of faith healing. The case contemplated in James is clearly one of a very serious nature, where death is imminent, and so also in 1 John 5. The idea of the scripture being used as a substitute for medicines which God has provided in nature is not only unwarranted, but is contrary to the scriptural and apostolic principle of using remedies for ailments, 
see both 2 Kings 20 verse 7, and 1 Timothy 5 verse 23. It is theological quackery. 7 Prayer in the name of Christ is so large a subject that it is dealt with in a separate chapter, that which follows.